Over the past uh, two or three decades, the uh, phrase politically correct has become quite popular in our society. <clears throat> it has really uh, redefined how, uh, what we say and how we say uh, and talk to each other. And the goal of political correctness is essentially to remove offense. <clears throat> For example, uh, political correctness steps in and tells me how to say things. When people are offended, politically correctness will remove the offense. Let me give you a couple illustrations of how things you can say to me to make me feel better. For example, you can't say to me that I'm short. Rather, you're supposed to say, I'm vertically challenged. And when I know that I'm not short, but just vertically challenged, I feel a lot better about myself, see? And uh, you can't tell me that I'm ho uh, fat. You have to say, I'm horizontally endowed. And then I'm, I'm not uh, struggling with fat shaming, you see? It really helps me. And then when I die, you won't say to me that I'm dead, but rather that I am metaphysically inconvenienced. So you see, all of those make me feel a lot better about myself. That's what political correctness does. As a matter of fact, political correctness has really affected football. And thank you so much. Well, second best. Thank you for the water. Appreciate that, Sharon. <clears throat> um, Political correctness has even affected football because the nicknames that teams use, if they happen to use the nickname for the team of a minority group, that is being seen as being insensitive. For example, Edmonton's football team, formerly called the Eskimos, no longer called the Eskimos, now they are called the Edmonton Elks. And so now the Eskimos in uh, northern Canada don't feel offended by the name of the football team Although I'm not sure how the elks feel about that, because I'm sure PETA, the animal rights people, are kind of concerned about using animals as nicknames for sports teams. But anyways, down in the States, the Washington Redskins no longer are called that in the NFL. They're referred to as the Washington Commanders. Tongue in cheek, some time ago, the U.S. News and World Report suggested that the Dallas Cowboys football team should be renamed as the Dallas Bovine Persons. And uh, they also suggested the New York Giants football team should be called the New York Spatially Challenged Individuals. So you have uh, eliminating certain kinds of offensive things. A couple of comedians in Vancouver have said that when it comes to our national anthem, the only part that we can now sing and actually be politically correct is the phrase, O Canada. In all of the rest of our national anthem, discriminates against someone or someone else, uh, someone or other, and that's oppressive, and so it is politically incorrect. So here is O Canada according to the politically correct, all right? So we can't sing O our home and native land because that's offensive to immigrants. Uh, true patriot love, that turns off small L liberals who equate patriotism with fascism. In all thy sons command, well, that said, it makes every feminist in Canada wince when she hears that. And do you know, since it actually has been changed, it's no longer in uh, all thy sons command, in what? All of us, all right? Um, from far and wide, well, the word wide is offensive to people who are fat or people of size, so you know that. We stand on guard for thee is offensive to pacifists, Quakers, members of the Green Party. Uh, with patriot love, we see thee rise. Well, not everybody's a morning person. And uh, then true north, strong and free. Well, between the GST and NDP budgets, what's free anymore? Uh, God, well, that's offending the atheists. Uh, keep our land. That First Nations people will argue with that being premature, pending on the results of their world court challenges on land claims. And so that's why you can only really sing, oh, Canada. And that's it. And the rest of it is politically incorrect. Well, that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it uh, 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 makes my point. And for sure, political correctness is even affecting the church. I like this cartoon it came across. The petition comes to the pastor's uh, desk from the congregation and requesting changing the term sinner to person who is morally challenged. And so sinner is offensive, you want to say, 
morally challenged. And it's been suggested that Jonathan Edward, who was a, Edwards, who was a famous uh, <coughs> missionary evangelist back in the, uh, in the uh, 16th century, in his 1741 sermon uh, entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, the politically correct Jonathan Edwards today would be spiritually impaired persons in the hand of a distraught supreme higher power. I want to say this. this some of this concern is legitimate. Uh, I'm making fun of c- certain aspects of this. But in the past, people have often been singled out or discriminated against because of these factors. I remember talking to a fellow in Stonewall some years ago who told me that his father had changed his very Ukrainian-sounding name into something a little bit more anglicized because he said, my dad couldn't get a job in North Winnipeg uh, back uh, in the 1930s. It it was uh, such a a discrimination against uh, Ukrainian people, so they changed their name. As a matter of fact, one of the guys in our church here, Daryl Argan, all right, I, I, I... how do you say your real name, Daryl? Arganisuk. That's his real name. So from now on, Daryl Arganisuk, that's who you are to me. And uh, we want to go golfing, Daryl Arganisuk? We go golfing together a lot. Now, some of the people listening to Jesus in the text that uh, Ralph re- uh, read for us earlier on didn't like some of the things that he was saying. And right in the middle of that whole conversation, Jesus asks the question, does this offend you? And that question is the one I'm going to look at this morning, together with a second question, because when he, what he said had caused some people to walk away, he then turned to his disciples and asked them, you don't know what to leave too, do you? And so we're going to look at those two questions as we talk about this topic this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to Look at the Word of God. We thank you for the truth that it contains, the teaching about Jesus, who is the Son of God, who came from heaven, the bread of life, who can meet every need in our lives, who gives to us eternal life, a hope of eternity beyond uh, life here on earth, and all these wonderful things, and that Jesus is the one and only answer to all of life. And yet, I know even as I say that, people wince with the offensiveness that they perceive of the exclusivity of that statement, the discrimination against uh, Muslims and Hindus and uh, non-Christian religions because they feel we're being um, discriminating against them, thinking we, we are better than they. Help us to understand how to walk through this minefield of, of conflict and to present the Lord Jesus Christ as who he really is. This morning I stand against all the forces of the darkness, command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go Holy Spirit, welcome you here. Guide and lead us into the truth. Bring glory and honor to yourself. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Every person who's ever spoken in public, and I have been doing it for 55 years now, uh, I know what it's like to have people react negatively to things that uh, are said. Um, The uh, Virginia, uh, Governor of Virginia, Claude A. Swanson, one time gave a speech, and afterwards a lady came up to him and said to him, you missed several great opportunities in your speech. And uh, Swanson asked the lady to do what? And she said, to quit. Well, people oftentimes don't like things that are spoken publicly, like I'm doing right now, up from the platform, from the front. Just recently, someone told me, this just happened in the last two months, that in their church, the pastor was preaching, and he was talking about sin, and he talked to, and he called people, us as people, sinners. I don't know if he quoted uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for all have uh, sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but he talked about that, and he said one of the ladies in his congregation became very angry at him for talking and calling her a sinner. And I I remember when I heard that, I remember thinking, wow, and I happen to know this lady. And I remember thinking, goodness sakes, the fact that we all have sinned is a cardinal doctrine of the Christian church has been from day one. Since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And here she was getting ticked off. Reminded me of the verse, 
uh, in Romans, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses th- uh, 3 and 4. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, suit their own desires. They'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Do you have itching ears? You kind of get ticked off when I talk about sin in your life? <laughs> Thanks, Bradley, for the encouragement. I shall. I have no intention of stopping. Um, it said, to, to what their itching ears want to hear, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Yeah, talk about the uh, 2024, this uh, being true all across our nation. So here's my point. You know, as a speaker, you want people to like you and your messages. Obviously, I do. But many times, people are offended by what I've said. And, uh, and in this case, this woman in, in this particular church uh, was uh, a big one, was the fact that her pastor called her a sinner. And she was upset. Well, <clears throat> Jesus had the experience also of having people reacting negatively against what he was saying. And in our text, he is speaking to the people he makes a very significant statement where he tells them that he had left heaven and came to earth. He said in uh, verses 32 and 33 of our text, it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So that's the statement he makes, and that statement didn't sit very well with his listeners. And they began to grumble. It says in verse 41 to 43, this, uh, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? In other words, I remember when he was born in Bethlehem. I know his mom and dad, Joseph and Mary. And he went to kindergarten with my Son Andrew, you know, this kind of thing. How can this guy say he came from heaven? Interesting how Jesus responds to their co- comments in verse 43. He says, stop, stop grumbling among yourselves. Do you oftentimes grumble when you drive home after church? And what you've heard and you didn't like what you heard? You grumble? Jesus says, stop grumbling. In other words, sometimes it's best just to take what you've heard, even if it hurts, even if it's not what you really want to hear. Because if it's true, you need it. Now, he then said something that absolutely shocked his listeners. And he said that they should eat his flesh. Verse 51, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And, of course, this upset the people even more than the fact that he said he'd come from heaven. Now he's telling them to eat his flesh. And it says, then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, that would have been absolutely shocking to the people of his first century hearers, shocking to us today. Cannibalism then, as now, was abhorrent. Um, And when cannibalism happened, people appropriately were grossed out. We have a uh, Example of cannibalism in the Old Testament story in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 26 through 30, were due to an invasion of Syria uh, invading Israel, and they siege, put a siege around the city of Samaria, and because of the siege, the people in the city of Samaria are starving, and some resorted in their starvation in desperation to cannibalism. And in verse 26 of 2 Kings 6, we read the story. And as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, Help me, my lord, the king. And so the king said, What's the matter? And she goes on to say, This woman said to me, Give up your son so we may eat him today, and tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, Give up your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden him. And it says in verse 30, and when the king heard this, he tore his robes. Tearing your robes is an act of, of agony, a horrible experience to see that. And to see cannibalism happening amongst his own people in that situation. Well, then in the text in John 6, Jesus makes an even more outrageous statement. And he tells him that not only should they eat his flesh, but that they should drink his blood. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Now, to Jews of that day, drinking blood was especially anathema. It was considered blasphemous for a person who of Jewish origin to drink blood. Because what the Bible in the Old Covenant, in, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, explicitly and very strictly prohibited, Leviticus 17, any Israelite who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person for who eats blood, and I will cut him off from his people. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make an atonement for yourselves on the altar. It's the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Therefore, I say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood. So then the question we can legitimately ask is, why did Jesus tell the people to drink his blood? Oftentimes, when Jesus talks, and you read the Gospels, you find a very interesting way he responds to uh, his people. He will use language in a very different way. In other words, if you take him at the crass, literal level, it may sound, in this case, gross and upsetting, but he has a significance behind that. And you have to understand that. Let me explain the significance. You see, when Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, what he was doing was he was predicting at this point in time, in John 6, how he would die on the cross. And on the cross, he would give his body to be broken for sin. He would give his blood to be shed for the sins of the, of the, of the world. And that's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, for what I received that passed on to you is a first importance, Christ died for our sins. So the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood are the cardinal parts of salvation. Absolutely incredible. And when he talked about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, he was actually at this point pointing forward to an event that is memorialized by something practiced today by every Christian church around the world, and that's called the Lord's Supper, communion, which we have here at the church on a regular basis. And as Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for sins. Eat this in remembrance of me. And what were you eating? You're eating, in this case, when in our church, we serve matzos, Jewish unleavened bread. It's a symbol of the body of Christ. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, when he had given thanks, he broke and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So that's the symbolism that's implicit in the statement, eat my flesh and drink my blood. But because this was such a strong statement and because they didn't understand it, it had a very negative effect even on Jesus' own disciples. And they began to grumble about it. It says in John 6, 60 and 61 on hearing this, Many of his disciples said, this is a hard saying. Who could accept it? And that's where Jesus asks the question that I've used for my sermon title. Does this offend you? Does this offend you? And the disciples were offended with Jesus and what he said. And they thought, you know, this time he's gone too far. You know, we put up with a lot, but this is over the edge. Now, all through his ministry on earth, people were offended by what Jesus uh, said and did, especially true of the Pharisees. In Matthew 11, I'll give you an illustration of that. Jesus made the statement to the crowds. He said, listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. But what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. And what Jesus was saying, you know what? If you eat pork, which you've been told, that really doesn't make you unclean. But it's when you talk and use, say, for example, the F word, or take God's name in vain. That makes you unclean. What comes out of your mouth? Now, the disciples then come to Jesus uh, in verses 12 and 14. It says, and they came to him and asked, and they said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Interesting, Jesus kind of said, 
leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into the pit. And the interesting statement there, he said, I don't care they're offended. I remember watching Candace Owen in one of the video clips talking about uh, um, the whole area of transgender. And one woman stood up in a session and said, you offended me. And, she, and Candace Owen said, get a helmet. Life's hard. <laughs> You're ticked off with that? You shouldn't be. Don't be ticked off with that. We too easily scandalized in this day and age. Well, in the same way, there's all sorts of people who are offended by Jesus. There are some who are offended by what he claims to be. For example, Jesus answered uh, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I want to say that this is probably considered by many to be today's most offensive statement. When Jesus again goes on to say, no one comes to the Father except through me, people consider this as toler intolerant. It's narrow. And they look at it as a very offensive statement. Franklin Graham, in his book, The Name, tells how shortly after the Columbine Massacre, and some of you uh, who are a little bit older remember that back in, uh, I think it was around the early 2000s, there was a, um, a couple of guys went into a high school in Columbine, uh, in Denver, Colorado, and massacred a whole number of kids with, uh, uh, with guns. And uh, he, uh, Franklin Graham was asked to speak at a memorial service uh, uh, and to talk about uh, uh, this experience. And he spoke about Jesus as the one who could bring hope and comfort to all. And so there's the name, the book, The, the Name, the Columbine Massacre. You can see the, the two guys there walking around with guns, people killed. And this is Franklin Graham speaking at that uh, uh, session. And after the service was over, he says in his book, a very agitated man came up and said to him, you offended me. And in the days following, local newspapers reported how Graham had offended many people because he'd used the name of Jesus Christ in such a gathering. And Graham in the book, uh, the name says, why is it when people curse using his name, hardly anyone complains. But if you speak about him with respect or pray in his name, some people call foul. This is not the case. It's interesting. You watch a movie. We were watching a movie the other day, a nice movie. And the, and the guy is, uh, says to his girlfriend, you know, and uses the name of Jesus Christ. And Linda says, I can't watch this anymore. I had to shut it off. Very, very common in, in uh, movies to use the name of Jesus. And yet if you talk about it in a public way, you're intolerant. Very interesting. I had uh, similar experiences myself. Over the years in Stonewall, I wrote a column in, uh, oh, I started back in 73, and I wrote till I think, 2017 when the Argus closed, uh, in the Stonewall Argus. And over the years, I got a lot of uh, responses from the weekly column that I wrote in the, in the uh, Argus, uh, many positive, but some not so positive. And one week, I had written about the statement that Jesus made in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to Father but by me. And in the following week, there was a letter in the editor, a letter to the editor in the Argus. And it says, Henry's view too narrow. So I've blown that up. So you can see, dear editor, I feel compelled to write to you as I do not see eye to eye with the religious views of Dr. Henry Ocerny, whose column appears regularly in the Argus. I would like to think that God is a God of love who embraces all of us, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, etc. Are those of us who don't follow the prescribed method of getting into heaven, as Ozerny outlined in his last column, then doomed to an afterlife below stairs? Interesting, she then goes on to make a statement. It may be time to change the format of this column to include some opinions from other clergy in the area representing different denominations because I was writing a weekly column there. Oh, maybe that's you. Maybe you're saying, how can you say you know, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and all the other good people in various religions are wrong? Only Jesus is right. It's interesting, the following week, a guy in the Stonewall Church, one of the fellows I pastored for many years, uh, Harry Schoenberg, wrote, Dear Editor, I'm writing in response to a letter to the editor regarding Henry Ozerny's quote-unquote narrow view, which appeared in the November 24th issue of the Argus. Mr. Ozerny wasn't expressing his opinion. He was quoting Jesus Christ when he said there's only one way to heaven. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
All that God is asking us is to believe Jesus is his son, that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, that he rose again on the third day. I fail to see how this is narrow when it has resulted in millions of people around the world becoming Christians. Well, that was a positive reinforcement. I appreciated the Harry writing that for me. But you say Jesus is the only way right away. You're considered narrow, intolerant, bigoted. Secondly, there are people who are offended by what God has allowed to come into their lives. And there's some hurt, some pain, some issue that's come into their life, some negative thing, and they become offended against God. They blame him, get angry at him. He allowed this to happen in my life some tragedy, some personal loss. This was uh, Gideon's challenge in chapter 6 of Judges. He said to the angel who came to him and asked him to uh, lead the uh, uh, Israelites in battle against the Midianites, and Gideon says to the angel, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all of his wonders that all of his fathers, our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us, put us into the hand of Midian. In other words, it's God's fault we're in this mess today. He was blaming him. And uh, his thinking in Gideon's case was, uh, shouldn't or couldn't have an all-powerful God done something to stop that? Couldn't he have stepped in? Blaming God for not intervening in the situation which they think he should have and change the outcome from the way it went. And a lot of people struggle with that. And they have terrible things happening. And all through the years, um, I have heard some pretty horrible things that have People come and share with me in the privacy of my office uh, about that. And, and people will say things like, if God really loved me, he wouldn't allow this horrible thing to happen to me. When I was pastoring back in Stonewall, I had a conversation with a, a gal who had been part of the church for many years. And uh, she came to see me one day. And she said, you know, Pastor Henry, a friend of mine has a teenage son who's battling cancer. And she said to me, that makes me very angry against God. And then she made the interesting statement, never forgot. She said, frankly, I no longer want anything to do with him. People get offended by God, what he allows into their lives. And then third, there are some people who are offended, not because of what God has done, but because of what other people who call themselves Christians have done. And you see this in the church all the time. People come to church and get offended. Somebody says something, and now they're mad at the church. They're mad at the people in the church. They get uh, upset by them. And they look down their noses and say, these people call themselves Christians, and yet they say things like this, they do things like this, they, whatever. It is the story that they have. And uh, they become upset, and they're offended because of what other Christians, people who they think should know better and shouldn't do what they did, did to them. First John chapter 3, John writes, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. He is gossiping maliciously about us. And not satisfied with that, or he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Here's a guy who wanted to run the church in that situation. <clears throat> Some time ago, I was uh, talking with a fellow. And it's interesting through the years to see how some Christians have been hurt by other, quote, unquote, Christian people. Uh, some spiritual injury that's happened to them. And some very hurtful things, I admit, can happen amongst Christians in the church. It can happen. Uh, I'll never forget a fellow telling me that he'd gone to a Bible camp as a young boy, eight or nine years of age. And he said uh, as he sat in the Bible camp uh, in the morning session, the camp counselor shared with him about Jesus. How Jesus died on the cross, paid a penalty of sins, and uh, made it possible for him to be saved. And he said that morning, as the counselor led him, he said in prayer, I pray and ask Jesus to come to my life, become a born-again Christian. And he told me, he said, later that evening when we were all in bed in the, count, in the cabin, that same counselor sexually molested me. His life afterwards just went in a spiral downwards, horrible, horrible mess afterwards. And now in his 50s, I spoke to him, still living under the bondage of that horrible, horrible experience. And then people say, well, that's Christianity. Forget it. And maybe you've had that kind of experience. Maybe that's in you. You've gone through that. 
Maybe somebody in the church, maybe even in leadership in the church has done something that's devastated you. And that's what you've said. That's Christianity. Forget it. I'm out of here. Well, I want to switch gears. I want to talk about committed to Jesus, offended by Jesus. But I want to give you the other side of the way you should look at this, okay? I know you've experienced offense. How do you respond? And you respond with commitment to Jesus. You see, some people let the offense become a turning away point in their lives. That's what happens in John 66, 66. From that time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You see, these people, when they heard what Jesus was saying, they did not like what he was saying, and they left him no longer to follow him as his disciple. Some years ago, I remember reading the book by Charles Templeton called Farewell to God. And Templeton was an evangelist who worked together with Billy Graham back in the 1950s. And many nights, he would speak to crowds of 30,000 people or more. However, as he and Graham work together, and in the book, he describes how he struggles with some of the things that the Bible has, it questions like the validity of the Old Testament, the teaching of the Christian church, and it brought about a crisis of faith in him. And in 1957, Templeton resigned from the ministry. And he made the statement, should one continue to base one's life on a system of belief that for all of its occasional wisdom and frequent beauty is demonstrably untrue? Well, I'll tell you what, I'm 75 years of age, and I've studied the Bible from cover to cover. I don't see any of this problem that Charles Templeton does. And I have a doctorate, too, so I've worked my, my way through all this. Um, I have total confidence in this, complete. Yeah. Take it on the basis of, of, you know, 65 years since I asked Jesus in my heart. Wow. Well, many people today leave Jesus as well. They leave, for example, by not going back to church. They stop attending church. Hebrews 11, uh, tw uh, 10, 25 says, Not forsaking your own assembling as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, all the more you see the day drawing near. And the way some people leave Jesus today is they stop going to church. They come to church regularly, and all of a sudden, bang, they're not around. Now, going to church and being involved in a church is one of the most outwardly visible means and ways of identification with Christ. Baptism is another big one for sure. And the local church is a visible expression of the body of Christ on earth. And so when you gather together, like you have done this morning, you are identifying with Jesus Christ. And it's the visible expression of the body of Christ on earth. Do you know that many of the books of the New Testament were written to local churches? For example, in the New Testament, books like Romans was written to Rome, the church in Rome. The book to the Corinthians was written in the church in Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae. And Thessalonica, all communities with churches. People gathering together, like you gathered together this morning here. Now, maybe as you've been going to church, you've been offended and you've been thinking of dropping out. And I see this over and over and over again in all the years. You see people come and all of a sudden, bang, you don't see them for a couple of weeks. And then a couple of months. And all of a sudden, they're gone. And... Walk away. Don't go to church. Other people leave by stopping to read their Bible and praying regularly. They may still come to church, but they no longer pick up this book. It's gathering dust on the shelf. They no longer pray, as the Bible talks about each of these aspects of the Christian experience. The, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law, he meditates day and night. A lot of people don't meditate at all. Uh, First Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. A lot of people don't. Pray at all. They still come to church, but they don't do these things. And then there are others who, who um, uh, leave by spiritually backing off. So they still maybe can read the Bible, still maybe pray, still go to church, but they just kind of back away. Don't get as involved as they once did. That's why in Romans chapter 2, Jesus says to the Christians in Ephesus, I hold this against you. You've forsaken your first love. You're not as keen as you once were. You remember when you first accepted the Lord, how on fire you were? What are you like now? Lukewarm. 
Oh, they're good. On fire still. Keep on being on fire, Bradley. Good. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> and everybody said? Amen. Good. I love you people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. You know that's what it says in the last days before the second coming of Christ? People aren't going to be flocking to the churches. They're going to be flocking away from them. Okay? Churches will be empty. Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? Very little. And that's why we want to be amongst those who remain faithful. And so what you see in these people's lives, their commitment to God begins to cool. Their fervor drops. The enthusiasm fades. And what happens often is that other things, even good things, are allowed to come between them and Jesus. And they no longer make it a priority for these other things. These other things take them away. They no longer do these things because these other things attract them more. I like the statement somebody said, if you're not as close to God as you once were, guess who moved? Now, some people who have been hurt by the church, I had some people say this to me. You know, Henry, I've left church, but I haven't left Jesus. I had a lady tell me this one time and so on. And I said, I'd like to suggest, I said to her, that the two, Jesus and the church, are integrally related. And here's why. You remember the man by the name of Saul of Tarsus in the Old Testament book of Acts, how he persecuted the Christians? It says in Acts uh, 8, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem and all the disciples all, uh, and all the, except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged men off, uh, dragged off men and women, put them in prison. He destroyed the church. And then later on, on the road to Damascus, when that blinding light shines, and he falls to the ground, he hears a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus who you're persecuting. Who has said he was persecuting the church? Jesus said, you persecute the church, you persecute me. See, we are integrally related. The church and the body of Christ. That's where Jesus asks the disciples the second question. You don't know what leave too, do you? I love, 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 love Peter's amazing response. Lord, to whom shall we go? You know what? Essentially, he was asking, what alternative do we have? What's better? I want to suggest to you when you're tempted, and you may have this experience, you maybe already had it, to walk away. You should ask yourself the same question. What's the alternative? What's better? I, myself, through the years, remember especially in my um, late teenage years and early 20s, but even before I went into ministry, I remember uh, I was tempted to give up on my Christian faith. So I remember thinking, should I keep on with this or should I just walk away? And then I would think to myself, what's the alternative? What's better? Um, even today, what's better? Uh, do I want to slide into a life? Yeah, I like this cartoon. I came up with this idea. Into a life of materialism and self-pleasing. Is that what I want? Is that what I'm going to go for? What's the alternative? Where do you go? When you walk away from Jesus, where do you go to? What's better? And to me, that seems so empty and unsatisfying, even if I am struggling in my faith. There's nothing better out there. And that's why I think also to myself, you know, what's going to happen when that inevitable day comes and I have to stand before God and give an account of my life and I've walked away? How am I going to feel then? What will I say then? Will I be glad then that I said, ah, forget it. I'm leaving Christianity. Will I be happy then? Obviously not. Here's the real reason for not being offended by Jesus and for not walking away from him. I love it, the answer that Peter gives to Jesus. And he says to Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life, and we believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. He's the answer for eternal life. So is Henry Ozerny narrow when he says Jesus is the way? Yes, because he is. There is only one way, and he has the words of eternal life. 
Muhammad doesn't have the words to eternal life. Buddha doesn't have the words to eternal life. Nobody else has the words to eternal life, only Jesus. I declare that to you, and that's guaranteed truth. And I'm unapologetic about that. I trust this morning you're not offended. You're committed. 